Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this webinar this afternoon. My name is Lynn Rubenstein. I'm the Executive Director of the Northeast Recycling Council, and I am trying to get a slide up and not succeeding. I just We just practiced with the speakers, and they know how to do this. Um, the uh, Okay, forget the slide. Um, welcome to this webinar about recycled content and paper opportunities and challenges. Um, before we get started, I do want to uh, thank our sponsors. Um, our silver sponsor is Casella Resource Solutions, and our bronze sponsor is Sunoco Products. I want you to please note that the webinar is being recorded and that tomorrow the recording will be available on the NERC website, and you will be getting an email about that. I do want you to ask questions. You will notice that we have a question, a chat box, question box, it's a question box, and use that, please. Um, and you're going to find that, if it's not already obvious to you, on the top right side of your screen, there's a little orange arrow. Click on that. That'll open up the dashboard, and you'll see the question panel. It's gray, and there's a little arrow. You click that, and then you can type into that and hit send, and we'll see uh, your questions. We are going to save questions till the end of both Laura and Terry's presentations, but I'll be um, monitoring them and seeing as they come in. So please do uh, uh, take advantage of that. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Terry Weber, and he'll be followed by Laura Rao. Terry is the Executive Director of Packaging at the American Forest and Paper Association, also known as AFPA. He leads AFPA's packaging sectors which includes container board and paper board producers. He previously led the state and local government advocacy program and joined the association in 2011 as the Western Regional Manager for State Government Affairs. He holds an undergraduate degree from Northwestern University, as well as a law degree from the University of Southern California. Following Terry, we'll hear from Laura. She is the Director of Global Sustainability for Sunoco Products. She is recognized for her expertise in packaging standards, regulations, government policy, and scorecards. Laura serves as a Sunoco representative to the Sustainable Packaging Coalition and is a member of the Board of Directors for AmeriPen, the American Institute for Packaging and the Environment, both of which she helped establish. She was active, she's an active member of the Consumer Goods for Forums Global Packaging Project, which designed to set global standards and metrics for sustainable packaging and served as the project lead for ISO work to create packaging and environmental standards. So both very impressive, have a lot of expertise to share with us. So with that, Terry, I'm going to make you our presenter. And um, uh, we will look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Great, we got it, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, yes. So as Lynn said, um, I'm the Executive Director for Packaging for AFMPA. Uh, so I work primarily with our uh, packaging producers. Um, just as a quick intro, uh, AFMPA, we are the, the National Trade Association for America's paper mills. Uh, may not necessarily be self-evident uh, from our name, but that is uh, bread and butter who we represent. We represent about 84% of U.S. production capacity and over 90% of capacity in what we call the packaging grades. Uh, here's a quick snapshot of the industry nationally uh, to help folks understand how the industry is structured. Uh, mills are the primary producers that turn wood chips or recovered paper into pulp and then into large parent rolls of paper. Parent rolls are then shipped to what we call converting facilities that turn paper into the finished product. For example, parent rolls of tissue, bleach board, and container board are converted, what we call converted, into consumer size rolls of tissue, paper cups, and boxes, for example. AFMPA's work is focused on supporting primary production, although many of our members also own large converting operations. In the recovered fiber space, just as some of our companies own forest lands to supply their mills with fiber, some companies operate recycling businesses in order to supply their mills with fiber. 
Historically, the industry's recycling businesses have focused on commercial and institutional collection, for example, backhaul from retailers. Although sourcing from municipal recycling is growing in emphasis as we near the practical maximum for commercial and institutional collection. This context is important because as you will see, the economic health of the industry is correlated with a high and increasing recovery rate and utilization of recovered fiber in production. So our industry has one of the most comprehensive set of quantifiable and measurable sustainability goals. Uh, striving toward a paper recovery rate of 70% has been a key component of our 2020 goals. Uh, to follow up on the progress we've achieved with this suite of goals, which we set back in 2011, uh, we've just completed a thorough process of developing our 2030 sustainable goals, and you can look forward to an announcement on those early next year, uh, probably January or February. Um, this I wanted to show you a quick snapshot of the paper recycling rate. So um, this shows you, you know, where we've gotten toward our 70% goal. Uh, you can see here that the U.S. recovery rate over the last 10 years. Uh, the trend line is slightly positive over the decade, though you know we're clearly still a little bit short of our 70% goal. Uh, this remains one of the highest recovery rates of any competing material. Uh, so the next chart I wanna show you is a slightly different way to skin the cat. Uh, while the overall recovery rate, that chart I just showed you, is only slightly positive over the course of the decade, the big positive story over that same period has been the increase in utilization of recovered fiber for domestic production. This graph more clearly reflects the effort and the tremendous investment that our industry and members have made in the mill infrastructure here in the United States. So why is there a disconnect between the overall recovery rate and the utilization of fiber in production? Uh, that has to do with the very significant disruptions we've seen in recent years to exports of recovered fiber. Uh, because this, again, this measurement is just the, the utilization here at home. Uh, so the disruptions we've seen in flows of recovered fiber to Asia and China uh, specifically is why we haven't seen as much movement as we'd like to see in the overall recovery rate. Um, but here at U.S. Mills, utilization of recovered fiber in production is higher than we've ever seen it before. And as you can see, this trend line over the past decade has been very strongly positive. The success of paper recycling is driven by complex, efficient, and dynamic free markets that move recovered fiber to its highest value end use in manufacturing new paper and paper-based packaging. This chart helps give you a snapshot of paper recycling flows in 2019. It shows you the major grades of recovered paper and the products that they are manufactured back into. As you can see, the main engine for paper recycling is recycling corrugated back into corrugated. That represents about the top half of that chart that you see here. And I want you to keep this slide in mind uh, when a little bit later we talk about our industry position on recycled content mandates uh, at the, toward the end of my presentation. So looking a little bit more closely at our most recent year for paper recovery, so we're looking at 2019 because this is the, the most recent year we have the full year's numbers. Um, you can really see here how the, the weakness in export markets for recovered fiber uh, impact the numbers. Uh, 2018 so far has been our record high year uh, for recovery rate at 68.1%. Uh, that notched down slightly to 66.2% in 2019. And that's largely, uh, as you can see, due to the decline in, in the volume of exports, um, specifically to China. And then, you know, to um, that brings the overall number down, even though there are other markets in Southeast Asia and elsewhere that have absorbed uh, some of that material. Um, and then OCC, uh, the other important thing to recognize, so we do separate out the recovery rate for corrugated containers, cardboard boxes. Uh, that recovery rate you can see on this chart is <clears throat> much higher than the overall paper recovery rate. So globally, the recovery rate for corrugated is about 90%, um, pretty close to what we see here in the US. Ours is a little bit higher than that global average. So it's pretty fair to characterize the corrugated recovery rate as getting pretty close to the theoretical maximum at this point. Although there are some specific opportunities, for example, such as improving uh, collection from residential sources, uh, specifically with e-commerce, as we know more material uh, is flowing through that stream. Uh, so like any other industry, COVID-19 has provoked some very specific changes uh, in our industry. Uh, specifically, you can see there have been sharp declines in, in products that are used primarily in offices, schools, hotels, and restaurants, all of which are, are closed. So that's led to a decline in consumption of printing and writing paper, commercial tissue, 
uh, and bleach board used by restaurants. We've also seen a sharp increase in e-commerce in the U.S. as consumers maintain social distance by ordering goods for delivery rather than making trips to retailers. And the global economic contraction, um, which you know the rest of the world is experiencing, has meant less demand for corrugated abroad, and that has meant less demand for recovered paper sourced from the U.S. Uh, to make paper abroad. So taking a look at where we are so far in 2020, um, this has been uh, a pretty good year uh, on the container board side. So to satisfy robust domestic demand, uh, we're seeing sharp increases in the domestic consumption of recovered fiber. So overall, you can see recovered fiber mill consumptions up two and a half percent, consumption of mixed papers up 3.3 percent, OCC up 4.1 percent. And just to provide a little bit more context, these numbers seem like they're small, um, but you know if you have familiarity with our statistics and, and historically and how they work, um, one percent movement, you know, is pretty significant movement in the world of our statistics. So. Uh, to see numbers that are that are higher than two and up toward three and four, those are kind of signifying uh, bigger bigger movements uh, than we might typically see um, for this industry. So I focus a lot on container board, and um, just so folks can appreciate why uh, why we do that. When you look at our container board mill system, it represents about half of industry production capacity. So around 30, 38, 39 million tons thereabouts of um, you know about the the 75 to 77 million tons of of production in the U.S. mill system. Um, and for the first time in 2019, just more than 50% of the fiber used to make container board at U.S. mills was recycled fiber. Um, so that's you know, what we call the utilization rate in production. Overall, U.S. container board production is up 4.3% so far this year. And particularly, there's strength in recycled container board production, um, which has, is up almost 12% so far this year. Um, and one of the things I'd also like to point out, you know, we we classify container board by grades. There's craft liner board, and then there's what we call recycled uh, container board. And that craft grade, which um, most folks, you know, might think of as uh, virgin container board uh, colloquially, I think it's important for folks to understand that um, there is some amount of recycled content in almost all the container board that's produced in the U.S. And even in what we refer to on the industry side as, as craft liner board or uh, what folks might, you know, commonly mistake for virgin container board, the industry average there is between 12 to 18 percent recycled content. So what even on the industry side you know the product that that we categorize as you know what might be in vernacular considered virgin contains a not insignificant amount of recycled content so looking at the next couple of years uh, there's a long list of announced expansions in domestic production capacity uh, and recovered paper consumption to go along with it uh, when you when you look at this list of mills here, and you know when they're scheduled to come online, there's a, a substantial amount of uh, additional consumption. Uh, this represents over uh, four billion dollars in investments that that our industry has made to to increase our production capacity and our ability to consume more recovered fiber. So just quickly, I want to go over a few of the efforts that. AFMPA uses as an industry that we're you know, taking on to improve paper recovery. Um, we're in the process of developing a design guidance for recyclability of paper and paper-based packaging. Um, we work on specific projects related to recovery of targeted materials that we've identified where there are more opportunities to recover more fiber. Um, and we have a general educational outreach program for um, recycled fiber. So our design guidance for recyclability, uh, that is upcoming. We're um, expecting completion of the project uh, toward the end and end of this year, beginning of next year, and publication of a, a final report shortly thereafter. Uh, the purpose of this is to inform our stakeholders um, about the recyclability of non-fiber components of paper products um, to you know help categorize what's easily recycled, what's less easily recycled, uh, and what's not recyclable. Uh, we've completed the data collection on this. Uh, we're doing a, a little bit of follow-up to make sure the research is solid and looking forward to publishing a report on this early next year. So we're hoping this will be a useful to, tool for our stakeholders once we get it out there. And then uh, turning to one of the specific projects uh, that we've been working on, pizza box recycling has been a focus for us this year. 
Um, one of our members completed a study uh, showing the recyclability of uh, pizza boxes on the paper machine. Um, so at levels of grease and cheeses, because this is one, probably one of the most common questions that we get asked, is are pizza boxes recyclable? Um, and we essentially have a, a study showing that at the levels of grease and cheese that you would typically find on post-consumer pizza boxes do not present problems uh, for manufacturing. Uh, and then we did a survey of our members, um, every, every member who responded, and we represent again over 90% of, of production capacity, uh, indicated to us that they recycle pizza boxes at their mills. Um, there's no issues with them. Uh, so we have come out pretty strongly this year trying to encourage uh, communities to update their guidelines, um, make sure we're being clear in our communication that you know the box is recyclable, but food is not. So make sure you're removing any excess pizza, um, but trying to simplify our communication uh, with consumers that uh, they don't need to worry about grease and cheese. Um, they just need to make sure that there's no pizza and then get that box in the, in the recycle bin. So this is just some examples here of uh, the communications we've been uh, pushing out on that. And then just generally, uh, we do a lot of uh, educational outreach. Um, again, you know, providing toolkits and, and information and, and direction, you know, all kind of working toward that goal of um, communicating clearly and simply to consumers about uh, what they can do uh, to get their material uh, clean and free of contamination collected in the bin. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about, because I know this group has a pretty strong interest um, in our our position on recycled content mandate. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, as as you've heard through throughout this presentation, our industry is certainly not opposed to using recycled content. In fact, you know, we have a better record on the utilization of recycled content in manufacturing uh, than just about any competing industry. We use more of it. We're looking to use more of it. Um, we you know, have consistent flows of investment in uh, technology and production capacity so that we can reach more of it um, and use more of it and improve our collection systems. So it's certainly not something we are against, um, but you know, kind of going back to that picture and maybe I'll just scroll back to it, um, understanding the complexity here of, of recovered paper and how it flows through manufacturing and how it ends up in finished products. Um, our position on recycled content mandates is basically that we feel like the industry is in the best position to determine what are the best uses in manufacturing, um, both from an environmental and an economic and a performance perspective, uh, that we are in the best position working with our customers to determine uh, which products that that recovered fiber goes into. Um, and so, you know, that's the, the most important thing to to recognize um, about our position on that issue. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you all. Great, thanks, Terry. There are many questions that have come in um, and I'm delighted about that. Um, so let's see, uh, Terry, uh, Laura, I'm gonna make you the presenter and I'm going to encourage the audience to continue to post their questions. And again, we will be uh, asking the, all the questions after the presentations are concluded. And Laura, I see your presentation and uh, you're good to go. Thank you. Super. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Let me make sure I can actually control this little thing. Hold on. Yay. Okay. Um, first, a very quick overview about Sunoco. Um, a lot of people see us as very different things. Um, and we actually, I like to say we make darn near everything out of darn near everything except for glass. Um, but we are a manufacturer, significant manufacturer of um, package food, packaging for the food industry, both in paper and plastic. We also um, have a protective group that provides protective packaging, both in paper and other um, substrates for, um, for manufacturing. We do some display and packaging, and then we also make a lot of the paper cores that go into the paper mills that are used, that, are, um, that Terry discussed earlier. So about half our business is global consumer, and the other half is global industrial, and then again, we have the, small, the smaller other divisions. 
We also have in the consumer um, industrial um, group, which is kind of, sometimes folks don't, under, don't know this, is we actually run and manage uh, four consumer MERS, so residential MERS, both in, um, in both the Carolinas. We have three in North Carolina and one MERS in South Carolina. And so we, we actually run the MERS for those systems, in addition to having multiple paper um, recycling areas that feed our mills. Also in paper industrial, in the paper industrial, we have. Um, let me go. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and keep going. But anyway, in the paper industrial area, we also have 23 100% recycled paperboard mills across the globe. 11, no, take that back. 10 are in North America, and um, and where we make basically 100% recycled paperboard for manufacture of um, consumer packaging like Pringles cans. Let me go back up here. But like the Pringles cans would be an iconic for. Um, um, I, an example of what we make, also the tubes and cores we talk about, and um, in fact, the one machine that uses virgin fiber is in the process of being um, retrofit to be one of the one of the most efficient and effective 100% um, uh, recycled uh, paper mills as well. So we we have a lot of experience in using recycled materials. We've also been recognized for that um, in a lot of different arenas and some of the some of the work that we've been doing in the area of, of um, sustainability. And you can see here some of our partners. Unfortunately, thank goodness, AFPA is on this. The last time I spoke, um, I spoke to CERDIC and NERC was on this slide, but CERDIC was not. So fortunately, I got you both on there as well. So I think I'm I'm I'm, I'm in good stead with everybody. So more importantly is our sustainability, um, kind of what we, we do. We're not a, a very vocal company. You don't hear a lot of us, a lot, you know, it's expand, you know, sitting out press releases about everything we do, but um, but we are quietly very effective. So currently, um, if you look at a, a, a how much we either recycle ourselves back into the marketplace or cause to be recycled through our recycling centers, and we also have a consulting group that actually works with manufacturing operations to recycle and recover the back of, basically the back of the manufacturing site materials. Um, if you take the weight of that material against the weight of the material we put on the, on the marketplace globally, um, we recycle or cause to be recycled um, well over 80% of, um, of that weight. So we are very, very, um, focused on, on recycling. In fact, currently for fi in the fiber arena, um, if you look at our raw material purchases and acquisitions, 96% um, is recycled fiber and our basically our global raw material purchases. 88% of that is post-consumer. And if you, and I know this is a fiber conversation, but if you look at um, plastics, 21% of our total of our total raw material purchases for plastics are recycled resins. 18% of that is post-consumer. Uh, I dare say you could put those numbers up against a lot of other companies and we'd win on that one. Also, again, our 10 North American uh, paper recycled mills I talked about earlier um, produce 100% post-recycled uh, paper board and that of that paper board, 85 to 90% is post-consumer. Generally, it's probably more than that, but we're being conservative in what we say. These are just giving you some other some ideas of things that you can make from recycled paperboard. Um, again, I mentioned the Pringles. I bet you didn't know that your um, that your biscuit rolls were made with a significant amount of recycled paperboard, and um, and then again the tubes and cords we talked about, some of the separator papers, toilet paper rolls. In fact, we really um, the run of toilet paper wasn't hurtful for us at all. But to me, one of the most interesting things made from recycled paperboard are tables. So these pedestal tables that have wood veneer on the outside are actually um, covered um, additions of our cores, our, our large cores. So um, we make an FSC certified bore, a core for um, a company that, that manufactures and sells FSC certified um, tables. So what are some of the challenges and opportunities that we see with recycled fiber? So, you know, it's long been a component of the packaging systems and, and absolutely should continue to be utilized in greater amounts. But what we see are some of the external design approaches and not necessarily by packaging designers, by, but by you know, regulators, government agencies, legislators trying to impact the packaging stream and address concerns they have over packaging, um, tend to not always align the package with the product. And I think that's something that has to be remembered always when you're talking about packaging, is that package exists for a purpose. It exists to, to protect and deliver a product. And if it does not do that successfully, then the environmental impact is much more significant than the environmental impact of the package alone. 
So, you know, so we want to see more approaches that actually combine the two. In fact, one of the concerns we had with the, with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation approach is that it tends to, to see packaging as a standalone entity and not as something that has a function that's, that's directly tied to it. In fact, a good example of this is we manufacture uh, the rigid plastic um, caulk tubes that you may see in the in you know Home Depot or Lowe's, the really the solid ones. And you know, those caulk tubes are made out of 100 percent high density polyethylene plastic, totally recyclable plastic. But when you put the silicone or the caulk or whatever else it is in that package, it renders it not recyclable. So again, the package and the product need to be held hand in hand. And also in this, and the other aspect we're seeing right now, which is interesting, it was which is a very interesting challenge is that paper and paperboard packaging is being included in these Ellen MacArthur new plastics economy um, commitments so that any board with more than 5% poly or other constituents that end up as milk residue would not be considered recyclable under those definitions. Walmart as a company, is a, as a, a retailer, has, has included paper pa paperboard packaging in the new plastics economy commitments, and it makes things very difficult when you're limited to 5% of the material not actually being proven to be recyclable. So use of recycled fiber and direct food contact also is or any fiber really in non in non-dry food contact applications. So water um, um, fatty applications require barriers. So while paper is a fabulous um, substrate for packaging, um, some of these are, are going to require special pulping systems in order to extract the fiber and responsibly recover the residue. A really good example of this is um, the aseptic carton, the gable top carton, and then also our composite cans. We find that they, they can recycle very, very easily and, and actually the fiber comes off. But we do know that they, rec that they need to be in special recycling systems, special pulping systems, recycling systems. We see these types of systems basically expanding too, with additional recovery aspects emerging. And I'll talk a little bit about something um, that we're doing in the UK now to demonstrate this. Today though, we are experiencing significant bias against barrier packaging. So we hear a lot, no, no composite materials, no composite materials, even though there are proven systems today to recover them. So packaging destined for specialized pulping systems like aseptics, like tabletop cartons, like our composite cans, hopefully, um, are often thought of as less sustainable than that going into a general pulping system. But the outcome, which is recycled paper, is the same, and the systems are emerging to recover, or basically recover all the components, not just the fiber. But the bottom line is first it must get collected. So what I want to share with you is a case study of some work that Kellogg's is doing, of this Sunoco is doing in partnership with Kellogg's in the UK to demonstrate that our Pringles cans and other composite cans can be recycled um, effectively. In fact, in some cases, more effectively than putting it in a general recycling system. So the plan that we have is um, to recycle Pringles cans with um, beverage cartons and gable top at uh, Sunoco Stainland Mill. So our UK mill in Stainland, uh, our Stainland mill in Halifax is, uh, has a separate pulper called a Tessa pulper that is used to um, recover the fiber from the, from the septics. And also we've, we're demonstrating that it can do that with the composite cans as well. And then what we're also seeing is, is what we also need is to recycle the polyaluminum barrier and the steel ends of these cans at a third party. Because again, under the new plastics economy, you could only um, afford to have 5% of that package not recyclable in order to claim that that package is recyclable. So, so we're looking at a, at a full recovery of all the elements that go into these, these packages. So the current situ situation, what we're doing right now is we have demonstrated that the Greenhouse cans and the UBCs, which are the aseptics and gable tops, um, can be pulled successfully, that the material extracted, the fiber gets, gets extracted almost exclusive, almost 100%, uh, and that the residuals come, across, come out very cleanly, including the metal ends, and um, can go to uh, pyrolysis or other um, you know, valorization processes. We're looking at, we're doing curbside trials in, um, in a couple of cities in the UK. And we're also looking, we're also working um, with one of the, the largest retailers in the UK on a return to store collection. So the next steps are, you know, we've also looked at how can, you know, again, we talked about sorting and collection being important. So the next step is, and what we've done right now already is we've worked with Tomra to determine what's the with, with NIR sorting, what is the um, spectrum that accepts both the, the beverage cartons and the um, composite cans or the Pringles cans? 
and we found a spectrum that works. What we're currently doing is testing that spectrum in three MRFs um, in three different countries in the U in the um, in Europe because they have different material flows. Because you know when you when you're telling an NIR reader to sort something, you can't say I want to unless you have um, uh, the Holy Grail, you know, watermarking. You can't say I want you to sort just composite cans and just septic cartons. So some other stuff comes in with that mix. And so what we're doing is we're sorting, we're doing these sorts at three different MRFs um, throughout, again, in Europe, to represent the different material flows and collection systems too, dual stream, single stream. And then we're going to take that material, either take it back directly or take the, um, the description of that material back to our MRF, our bill, I'm sorry, and um, in the UK and say, okay, is this material acceptable? So everything that comes along with it, you know, what is acceptable to the mill, what is not acceptable, so that we can start to tweak that, um, tweak those readers. You know, manual sorting is easy. You just have to say cartons, septic, and round cans, and that's, you know, they have, they, it gets goes into to the um, UBC stream. So the next steps, we're going to be scaling up the curbside. We're scaling up at um, Depot Systems, which is where Bring Bank is, and um, ACE, which is, which is the equivalent of the Carton Council in, in Europe, is, has identified a polyaluminum recycler for all this operation who, where we thought we had to remove the steel ends from the composite packaging before it could go through this process. Um, the, the recycler is saying, hey, we shred and sort anyway from metals. We'll take them and recycle the ends for you. So by adding paperboard cans to the beverage carton recycling stream, it really makes um, a lot of sense. So one, we don't alter the efficiency of sorting beverage cartons. That's one of our key priorities. And also making sure, if it's not in here already, but making sure that the material that's going through our mill is, is not changed as well. We're not going to increase the amount of pollutants in the stream because we're finding in uses for it. We're also not gonna affect the efficiency of the beverage carton recycling process as well. Um, that efficiency will be maintained. We'll also increase the amount of paper materials being sent to recyclers. So hopefully getting some of the material that's in the mixed paper stream or other stream out of it and into a, a bona fide recycling stream. We'll increase the volume of polyaluminum to develop um, the valorization processes. So that'll go along with some of the other efforts in Europe and also emerging in the US to find um, ways to recycle film, plastics that, cannot, um, that can't go through a mechanical recycling system. We're also looking at, um, by adding more material to the UBC stream, we'll be increasing the volumes and hopefully optimizing the transportation as well. Um, that will also allow for reduced storage and bunkers and the and material can be shipped quicker, the bales of material can be shipped quicker to the mills. And for the UK, and this is a UK project at this point, we're gonna make it more attractive for the councils to see value in collecting the material. So what we're so some of the opportunities we're seeing is that you know again emerging agreement is that some form of EPR is coming and so that's going to provide some some potential funding for not necessarily all of these steps that I just described but but as it looks to the broader expansion of recycling recycling opportunities and the ability to to gener to utilize some of this new technology coming in that's going to help this project as well. Because we're seeing alternate, alternate recycling or advanced recycling, however way you want to call it, becoming a reality for, uh, for basically addressing most critical issues while uh, allowing people to achieve these new plastics economy targets. So pyrolysis is being, is being tested as a solution to build residue. Um, and then we're, we're looking at a phased in process or starting with pyrolysis and then moving toward chemical recycling because you know, quite honestly, once the system moves to the US, which we're hoping it will, <coughs> excuse me, you know, we need so many pyrolysis operations that are, that are working in order to make it cost effective for um, for chemical recycling to make to make sense. So with that, I'm going to stop and open the and allow it, Lynn to open the door for more uh, for questions. So I'm hoping that uh, if I wasn't clear on some of this, you'll ask me to clarify some things. Thank you. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you. That was wonderful. And you both. Um, not surprisingly, have had um, tons of questions. Um, I'm gonna see if I can succeed this time in getting my webinar sponsors to light up. Yay, okie doke. So um, uh, I've been actually uh, copying them um, into a Word document for myself so that I can, they have been coming in so quickly 
that I just can't see them. So um, let's, I'm gonna go kind of in the order that the presentations were made. Ugh. Thus the risk of me trying to read my Word document, huh? Um, Laura, um, I mean, actually I'm gonna start with something that, that you said because uh -huh. uh, reacted, a lot of reaction. Were you defining paralysis pyrolysis as a form of recycling? In and of itself, no, it is not. It is a first step though for chemical recycling. And so in order to gain, to get to chemical recycling, you have to take the byproduct or the result of pyrolysis or gasification and turn it through another chemical process that makes it a feedstock into other plastics. So in and of itself, it's not, but the, you know, the reality is you can't get to chemical recycling without expanded um, feedstock going into it. So we, we see this as a phased process, not a everything has to be perfect before we launch. So we're going to try, we're going to, we're working on this, especially in the UK project. We're doing it in phases with the recognition that we have to get to the ultimate uh, chemical recycling. Okay, thank you. So Terry, there were a lot of questions relating to how AFMPA calculate the recovery rate. Uh, and so some of the questions were, I mean, some were just that straightforward. How do you calculate the recovery rate? But there were also many that were asking more specifically, uh, were you looking just at domestic uh, within the United States? Were you, what, were you comparing it to all materials sold everywhere or just um, uh, in the United States? So we, we need a little bit more um, detail on that, please. Right. So the way we calculate the recovery rate is the way that it is typically calculated everywhere in the world, which is um, our production capacity plus imports minus exports are the denominator. And um, the denominator is um, mill consumption of recovered fiber um, plus exports of recovered fiber for recycling. So essentially you're capturing what, what the recovery rate captures is um, all the material that we're, that is being exported for recycling. So that's what makes it different from the utilization rate. So when I say the utilization rate, that is the percentage of uh, fiber as it's coming off the paper machine, what percentage of that fiber is uh, recovered versus um, virgin material. So um, thank you, that, that's helpful. Uh, there, however, there, however, there are still a number of questions. People saying, you know, I, I see lots of uh, cardboard and paper in my MRF, excuse me, in right. my landfill. Um, so how could you be saying there's a 90% recovery when I'm seeing that all over the place? <laughs> um, common question. Um, the answer has to do with, uh, there's, a lot, there's an awful lot of cardboard out there. Um, and 80 to 90 percent of it doesn't touch a MRF. You know, it flows through a retail store. Uh, it's backhauled to a mill from there. Um, you know, that that being said, we have you know kind of taken a look at what the rough percentages of recovery you know might be through the residential stream, and they're lower. But that's just kind of the reality of it. It's a more complicated collection system than just bailing uh, clean corrugated at a store and backhauling it to a mill. If it's got to flow through a MRF, there's more potential for contamination. It's commingled with other materials. It's got to be sorted out. Uh, so the reality is the, the recovery rate for corrugated that has to flow through the residential system is probably half of what it is, you know, flowing out of commercial or institutional collection. So the other piece that's not captured that's probably noteworthy for that calculation is corrugated that rides in on imported product um, is not part of our recovery rate calculation. So, and that would definitely be a piece of the corrugated that uh, folks are potentially uh, seeing. So when I say that, that means, um, for example, consumer products that are sold off the shelf at a retailer, they come, um, packaging is produced near where products are manufactured. So if there is a consumer product manufactured in China, it is gonna be typically packaged and corrugated that's also manufactured in China. Um, that amount of corrugated gets shipped in and it's available for recycling in the US, but it's not part of our recovery rate calculation. So to for us to try to gather 
to capture that, we have been experimenting in the past few years doing a calculation of what we call the effective recovery rate, uh, where we essentially take out the calculation of material that we know cannot be recycled and try to add back in uh, using an estimate um, based on census statistics of imported consumer products and a calculation of box intensity of those respective products, trying to estimate that amount of material, packaging material that's writing in on imported product. Um, so that something that is a statistic that we do um, share with folks but it is just an estimate uh, at this point because you know we've got to do there's not exact statistics in the way we like the way there is when we calculate the traditional recovery rate um, but we are tracking that data and we have growing confidence that um, that that number is uh, in the way we calculate that number so it will probably be a number over the course of the next few years I would expect you will hear more from us uh, on what what that number is because it helps us identify where frankly where the opportunities are for recovering additional corrugated so thank you that was very very helpful one last uh, question related to that specifically do you calculate cycle cy cycling rate for paper products by state and if yes is that data available <laughs> So we, yeah, we we have attempted to tackle that question in the past, and what we have found, um, you know, we spent a fair amount of money on consultants trying to nail down, um, nail that down, and see if we could solve that riddle. And generally, what we found is that the flows of recovered fiber are too complex um, in terms of where where the fiber is produced, where products are packaged, where it's consumed, where it's collected for recycling. Um, it just the fiber flows across state boundaries so much that we could not find any reliable way to calculate the data. We did come up with some kind of back office estimates, but they were within like a 20% range. So, you know, us saying that the recovery rate for paper in a certain state is, you know, 60% plus or minus 10 to 15% is not, not a horribly helpful calculation. So it's not something that uh, we have pursued but you know at, the, at some point if there's opportunity for better data where we could calculate a reliable number it's something we would pursue but based on the work that we've done uh, we haven't been able to come up with a reliable calculation at this point okay thank you so laura can you uh, reflect on how does the cost of recycled fiber compare to the cost of virgin pulp i would have to take a wild guess because we really don't um, use a lot of virgin pulp in our material in our materials we have a and where we do we have our own forests so um which are going to be used in conservation uh, activities after after we convert that other mill so i wish i could tell you but terry might be a better person to tell you than that okay terry <laughs> sorry terry um yeah i mean i mean the i i don't you know, as a trade association, we don't really discuss price, so I, I don't really have okay. any specific cost estimates for you. It's going to be very specific to, um, you know, the region and uh, the cost of material coming out of collection and uh, the fiber that they're using and, and the kind of yield that they get. There's just, there's a lot that goes into that calculation. But, you know, when you look at the split that our industry uses, you know, where it's about, you know, our utilization rate's about 58% version, about 42% recycled. Uh, they're competitive with each other. It just kind of depends on the product that you're making and the specifications and performance you need um, is going to, you know, all go into that calculation of what fiber selection you're going to use. Yeah, great. So, so speaking of that, um, Laura, why does Sunoco use recycled content? Um, I think, well, wow. I think we started off using virgin content, which is why we do own some forest land. Um, but that was a long time ago, but because the materials that the products that we're going into don't require the use of virgin material. They're, we use virgin material when we're, we're creating a barrier or we have a printed label that has to be, um, that has to go on a package. But uh, for the most part, we can, we can effectively make the packaging and the products that we, that we need with recycled material. So, um, and so I think it's just one of those things where we're in a, we're in a market that enables us to um, use recycled material and to use you know, more of it as we expand. Okay. So uh, Laura, you touched a lot of um, people's buttons when you started talking about pyrolysis. So we have a number <laughs> of questions around that and okay. uh, I'm gonna try to um, consolidate them. But one person asked, you know, how common is the uh, use of pyrolysis in the paper industry? 
Well, it's not because really this is kind of an interesting aspect. I'm sorry for the light. I cannot figure out how to get away from that uh, the edge of my screen. Um, so it's it's really been designed for the plastics industry. But you know we we have a Murph in Raleigh, North Carolina, that any of our film and non-recyclable plastics can um, can go to that to a pyrolysis center that opened up very very close to us. So we're able to to valorize that material. And it just sort of came to us that when, especially um, when I was in California at our paper mill there, I looked at, our, at, the, at the material coming out of the back end of the paper mill, which in California has to be landfill because they won't allow pyrolysis anyway. But it was pure plastic. It was not wet, nasty, fiber infused plastic. It was um, polystyrene pieces, which we all kind of hate seeing in our, in our paper mill, and strips of plastic. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. Why can't we bundle this up and send it to something, someplace that can use it for a beneficial use rather than landfilling it? So as we started, um, and, and then while we were, were, were working with the, the UK mill, um, the local, there's a local paralysis operation that has um, kind of set itself aside a little bit by using, being able to extract the foil from poly and foil. And so they sell both the, um, the foil into the, back into the marketplace and then they also use the, paral the plastic for the paralysis oil. And um, they actually contacted our Stainland Mill when they heard what we were doing as far as having a special pulping system and said, let us test your, your um, your residue. Let's see what happens here. And so we've done a couple of trials with them and with some minor modifications like a dryer because it does come out wet and some other things, um, they felt it was a good feedstock for them. So I think it was one of those things that's an emerging technology based on the fact that, you know, Sunoco for um, for all it's, it's good and ills in some ways, um, people who don't like plastic, we manufacture in both plastic and, and paper. So um, we engage in those, those systems that both suit plastic and paper. So this was one of those kind of beautiful opportunities to solve the two merge. Um, we're actually talking to a recycler of cartons in the US to send um, some of their residue down to this, mar this paralysis operation that we're connected with. Um, to see if that residue is suitable for that as well. But um, COVID kind of knocked all those plans aside for a while. So otherwise we would have had maybe some results and some ideas going forward. Okay, great. So you mentioned the uh, Pringles experiment. Uh, there uh, were questions about that. And some of them were kind of, um, well, how come you're not doing it here? That wasn't how they put it, but you know, why, why in the UK? <laughs> Okay, well, because one, it was, um, it's easy to control there in the UK. We own the mill. Um, so the only mill that's really re effectively recycling large quantities of aseptic cartons and gable top cartons is our mill. So we own the system. We can control, you know, experiments in terms of can we have experiments? How much is it going to cost? You know, because a lot of times mills do not like to disrupt their pulping operations to test somebody else's materials. So this was a kind of, a, in a way, it was like a very closed microcosm of the, of, you know, the rest of the world in some ways that we could have some, you know, controls over in terms of making sure that, you know, we're, we can, um, like, for instance, if I want to, if I want to toss in something else, like if I wanted to toss in coffee cups in this, into this process, to see if it works, we have the ability to do it. So it was more having um, having a, a very willing partner in Kellogg's wanting to explore how to get their Pringles cans into a, a recycling stream. They, they felt very strongly about it. Um, so they were willing to work with us, um, engaged us, having the mill controls, and also having kind of an open attitude in the UK towards, towards trying to find some of these solutions. And then the other thing was, you know, you had the Carton Council equivalent over there, ACE, that was also very involved. So it was just, a, it, was a, it was a confluence of everything that kind of worked in terms of um, basically creating a design for experiment and proving it out. But now that we're in the process of trying to prove it out, and again, we've got some wrap up things that we need to do, but we'll be putting together a white paper. That white paper will be available. And then we'll start moving then the, the findings from that and leveraging that in, in both Europe and in and definitely North America. We, we have plans for North America as well. Okay, great. So you alluded to the next question I was gonna ask you. Okay. Um, we need you to re, uh, look into the future and tell us what the future looks like for paper beverage cup recycling? I think, okay, so, and this is Laura Rowell speaking, this is not Sunoco speaking, so I wanna make that perfectly clear and you're recording it so I can come back and, and prove it. Um, if, I were to, if I were to create my utopia, my utopian recycling system, 
it would be that um, that the mills that do not have the special recycling, special pulping systems, get good clean fiber material, corrugated boxes, plain paperboard boxes, and stuff to run their facilities. Those are include some of ours. Then there is, would be a, se a separate set that are currently know how to recycle things like beverage cartons, like our composite cans that can accept things like coffee cups, ice cream tubs and things, have systems to recover that fiber, have it go into a good quality fiber stream for the, for the paper mill, and then have that residue able to be taken to a place like a pyrolysis or something that might even emerge that'd be better than pyrolysis over time. Um, so that the whole system is, is so all the material coming out of that system is recovered in one way or the other. Okay. So, so, so I'd love to weigh in on this one too. Oh, thank you. Um, Go for it, Jerry. <laughs> so this is, this is a, something that we've been doing a lot of work on from the industry side, just trying to harmonize a little bit, um, kind of what's going on out there and then how we are communicating that with folks. And if you look at um, the mills that uh, consume mixed paper, um, you know, there is a, a document out there that has the, the more than 20 mills uh, who accept uh, polycoated paper cups for recycling as part of uh, their mixed paper stream. And those mills represent more than half of the mixed paper consumption in the United States. So paper cup recycling is something that's happening today. Uh, it's something that will continue to happen in the future. I think as we continue to kind of work through some of the, techni the technical issues on the, the back end of the industry side, um, that it will not be too many more years before we'll be able to have a more definitive statement on the recyclability of that material. But I would just say there is tremendous opportunity there. Um, when you look at the consumer behavior that we would need to achieve, all we got to get people to do is pour the liquid out. And then you have a product that by weight um, is, you know, typically 90 to 95 percent fiber with just a very small amount of plastic. Um, so and it tends to be very high quality fiber. It's, you know, tends to be, you know, virgin fiber that's, you know, very long fibers. Um, you know, very desired among, you know, producers of, of tissue products and other products that use mixed paper um, as a fiber source. Uh, so just when you when you look at all of that, kind of the big picture, you know, the ease of consumer behavior and the value of uh, the potential value of the material as a recovered product, I am very bullish on that, you know, we will be able to solve the riddle of paper cup recycling um, in not all that long. So I really look forward to being able to um, engage with, you know, everyone on this when we get to that point. Okay, great. So I was about to switch back to the perennial pizza box conversation. And now you've introduced an angle in the beverage cups that is actually, I think, relevant to both. So. Um, a couple of people commented that they, you know, gee, that's great, but their Murph does not want those pizza boxes coming through. And they still want to tell people to either be composting them or putting them in the trash. And in fact, some uh, somebody pointed to an, uh, one of the large uh, recycling companies uh, uh, actually provided a URL where they specifically say on their website, do not recycle pizza containers. Um, so there's that. And the reason I thought it related to the beverage cups is because um, you noted that there are, uh, I believe you said 11 mils, but that doesn't translate for Lynn's brain that MRFs are willing to take it, to send it there. So um, pizza cups, what do we do about the end markets that are say that they can accept uh, and perhaps want this material, and yet you have the relationship that um, residential recycling programs have with the MRF, where they're getting totally different information. And I, you probably both want to respond to that. You know, this, this goes to the perennial riddle of, you got to get everyone on the same page. And it depends on who the consumer is that you're using. And, you know, I want to be very clear that, you know, when we make our statement about pizza box recycling, we're talking about U.S. mills and not all of the fiber that's collected in the United States is recycled at U.S. mills. So there might be some MRFs that have export customers that have um, more stringent standards than, you know, would be the consensus position of the U.S. mills that we represent. Uh, so that's entirely possible. And that's, that's why it's you know something of a free market. What we have been very clear about in this past year is that we, as an industry, and more the more than 90% of production and consumption of OCC that we represent, our mills say they want pizza boxes. 
and the behavior of consumers, you know, what we typically find, what people might consider contamination is not a problem for us in production. So we are being clear from that angle. So we understand that we've got to work with other stakeholders and that getting kind of clear communication throughout the system um, is an important component of it. And that's the next phase in this. You know, I'm not representing that that phase in this work is complete. It's the next step. Um, you know, there's lots of controversy. People want to send stuff to compost. I hear from composters too, there's too much packaging going into compost. They want to see less packaging and more food. Uh, so, and I think that's an important thing to understand about us as an industry position is that if it's possible to recycle material, we want to see material recycled. Uh, composting can be a solution for material, for products, if it makes the most sense, if there's a high likelihood that they're going to be disposed of with a, a decent percentage of food. But our goal as an industry is to get to the point where we are recycling fiber if it's possible and economical to recycle it, and then we can look at some of those other options. Okay, Laura, do you have anything you specifically wanted to add to that? I would almost say ditto. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we want the material to recycle and, um, you know, we want to see it go beyond, beyond you know, if this, if this system works, then it can go beyond paper cups. It can go to ice cream cups. It can go to other things that folks say, oh, we can't recycle it. So I, I think the, the, the big issue is to, is to, to walk backwards and to, in, in that if the mills want it and the mills are telling you they want it and they're telling the MERS they want it, then the, I think the MERS need to be looking at ways to, to, to separate it and get it to them. And if there's a disconnect in between, then that conversation needs to occur. So we try to work out what are the, what are the solutions? Because I know one of the, the, one of the problems with MERS, one of the reasons we've gone the way that we're going or we're looking at with the composite can and, and the septic cartons is that it was specifically designed to not ask the MERV to do a separate sort and even separate, separate sort. Because right now we know they're being asked to sort, you know, corrugated, mixed paper, beverage cartons, um, you know, PET, PET thermoforms. So, you know, if you take a, li a list of the things that everyone wants sorted separately, the MERS can't do it. And we know that from experience with our four, with our four MERS as well. Um, you're limited generally to six or seven or eight bays, eight if you're lucky, but mostly six, you know, six or seven bays. So everything that you decide to separate has to have, you know, good economic value. So one of the reasons we, we looked at the program with the Pringles can the way we did is to say, what is already existing that we can then add to it and then possibly add, again, if we want to add coffee cups or something like that, add to it so it doesn't require, um, you know, the MERF to, to set aside a separate sort. Okay, great. So switching um, away from pizza for the time being, um, had a, a specific question about copy paper and recycled content and a question that wasn't about that, but I'm going to interpret as being about that. So um, what is the status of recycled content copy paper in the United States? And what is the highest percentage that is available out there? Do uh, Terry, do you know the answer to that? Um, uh, so so you know, it's a complicated question. Um, there, uh, I, I, I really can't speak to the availability. There's been a lot of disruption in that market is what I'll say. You know, if you go back to my slide on the impacts of COVID-19, uh, copy paper has been one of the most impacted uh, segments of our right. industry. So, you know, before there was a pretty diverse offering. Um, I, you know, I, so I really can't speak to, you know, what's being offered out there, but kind of going to, um, you know, back to that slide I showed on the flows of recovered fiber. Um, copy paper is one of those products uh, where the, the utilization of recycled content um, can be more complicated uh, just from a performance perspective because, you know, United, you need it to be kind of a nice bright white uh, color with uh, no specs. Um, you know, there, there are just performance issues there that tend to lead that product to use a higher percentage of, of virgin content. Um, but that being said, when you put it in a recycled bin, it's a very desired feedstock going into tissue products that are also that white that nice bright white color um, and then you know there's some recycled content cup stock out there being produced that kind of utilizes that white fiber uh, as a feed stock too um, so I think that's kind of the 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 important thing out there is that you know cost is going to be uh, an issue when you're talking about that product uh, sometimes environmental performance because the energy profile of uh, a virgin fiber is a little bit different than recycled fiber. Uh, so that's that's one, you know, when you're kind of looking at that product in particular, it's uh, important to take a lot more factors into consideration than, uh, than just recycled content. Okay, thank you. So you, uh, Terry, in your presentation, you noted that, um, well, AF and PA 
supports uh, minimum recycled content requirements that you do not support. I, apologies if I incorrectly paraphrase this. You do not support um, somebody else telling the industry what that recycled content should go into. Uh, so first of all, did I get that? <clears throat> Did I capture so, that correctly before we go further and I add to it in my mistakes? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I think the important thing to understand is that um, we're typically not supportive of, of government intervention to say that you know a specific product needs a certain amount of recycled content. Um, I think what what it, you know what I was communicating through mine is that you know our our industry has a record and we have a, a strongly positive trend line on our utilization of recycled content. We are consistently putting more and more recycled content into our products every year, uh, with every year that passes. Um, but you know, kind of from a technical perspective, we are, we are better positioned working with our customers to decide where the good opportunities are to put more recycled content in products. Okay, so I, I think that you've um, pretty obviously hit on a, a point of tension between an industry perspective and perhaps a government perspective. Um, we want X amount of recycled content and X. And, and industry is saying, well, we're not disagreeing. We're just saying that may not be the best application right now, or that may disrupt another opportunity. So are there any, and the questioner actually used the term low hanging fruit, where it's kind of a no brainer that AFMPA, they didn't say no brainer, I said that. <laughs> AFMPA could you know, get out there and say, we want to see X percent minimum recycled content in this application, that there's no reason on earth why that isn't happening. Are there any opportunities along that line where AFPA could really come out in support of a minimum recycled content mandate relative to a particular product type? Um, no, you know, just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just be that blunt about it. Yeah. I, I think you you will see, and uh, you know, I think everyone who pays attention to our sustainability uh, goals announcement early next year, you will see that our industry has a very specific commitment uh, over the long term to um, improving and increasing our utilization of uh, recycled content in the manufacture of our products. But it is important. Uh, that the flexibility remain in there, that uh, we we can move it from product to product. You know, I think what I have presented to you all today is that oh, when you look at the industry overall, the trend line is that we are is strongly positive that we're using more recycled content, and that is the important part of the story to focus on, not on individual products. Okay. So the next question I'm going to ask, uh, it may fall um, in the same category as the one earlier, which Terry, you appropriately said, we don't talk about pricing, um, which is, so you both provided all these great examples of the use of post-consumer recycled content. And some of those uses being non-fancy, you know, like, like cores, toilet paper rolls. So why is the value of mixed paper so lousy? I, I, the most the away? most I can say on that is supply and demand. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you you used to have a, a situation where you had a large overseas market that was consuming, you know, a very oversized amount of that particular grade. Um, <clears throat> I think you've seen in the statistics that I presented that there's a strong positive trend on of consumption of that grade at U.S. mills because they they see an opportunity. There's there's an oversupply there. Um, and you know the the cost evaluation is attractive, so you're seeing more mills gravitate toward investments that allow them to use more of that material. So markets are working; uh, it will adapt over time. And you know they never work as fast as anyone wants them to be, wants them to. Um, but the the flow of capital investment, I you know I think the other takeaway that folks should have is that in investments in paper mills are not insignificant investments. Um, you know we're talking investments that are in the tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, improve our consumption profile of recovered paper. So it's important that those investments still be allowed to happen because it's a, the robustness of those end markets. It's the mills consuming uh, the recovered paper that's uh, uh, going to improve, you know, the situation in in mix the economics of mixed paper. Uh, we've got it. We've got to have. We got to allow these companies to continue to make those investments. Okay. Laura, did you want to add to that? No, I agree. Supply and demand. Okay. Great. So we had a couple of technical questions about 
the act of recycling. And um, Laura, I'm anticipating that you'd be the appropriate person to respond. So um, how are envelopes with windows recycled? It's not a grade that we typically seek out. So what I can just tell you is from, is that basically the window envelope, uh, if you're, I think the question is about what happens to the window envelope. Probably. So the window envelope gets into the pulper. Think about a pulper as a big blender. So with a, with a string in the middle or a big wire in the middle that collects all the um, plastic and wire and things like that. So uh, the window envelope would be, if it's not chopped into bits, which depends on the type of window envelope, um, it would be caught up in that ragger. And then um, depending on the mill and the mill's opportunity, that ragger can either be um, you know, chopped into bits and, and burned as a fuel source or um, with, with the metals extracted or um, it can just go, it can go to landfill, but, um, but really, but the, depends on the type of plastic envelope, I guess. Um, I'm not that familiar with what happens to them. I know what happens to our plastic stuff, but not that. Um, I mean, it could just, you know, basically just come out of the pulper. Okay. Now, what about um, glue? How does that affect pulp? This person comments that they work at a recycling center and they get a lot of glue filled hard tubes um, and corner pieces yeah we okay so our our cores which have a fair amount of glue the glue is water soluble so we can chop those and recycle them we do it every day um and our and our and our packaging like the pringles can and others can you know can be cycled as well because again the, the glue that we're using to, to combine those plies into that tube is water soluble what the paper industry really hates is um, hot milk glue because the hot milk glue, you know, basically disperses in the hot, you know, steamy pulping environment. Sometimes it can get into get through the screens and get into the paper. And then when you're you're putting you're rolling paper on a on a roll at high pressure, then as you unroll it to print or to utilize it, then it can cause tears. So water soluble glue, good. Non water soluble glue, not so good. Right, and and I wouldn't expect that a MRF operator or a residential recycling program could visually tell the difference. Is that true? No, they can't. And that's why, you know, again, we kind of, we, we try to utilize more of the water soluble glues and that's, you know, and the, the glue issue. I don't know, Terry, if it's coming up in the, in the design guidances with AFMPA, but I know it's something that um, we're also engaged in a similar effort in Europe called for Evergreen. And again, you know, paper industry trying to get design guidances and protocols and, you know, and, and we, we, we feel that at least in the forever green process, the, um, the hot milk glue is not not preferred. But it is required in some cases though. You have to, you know, it has a purpose, which is why it's being used. If it, we could totally substitute everything to water soluble glue, I think the industry would, but there are, there are applications that require hot milk glue as well. So we're not gonna get rid of it completely, but if you end up with a small amounts of it, it doesn't create as much of a disruption at the mill. Okay, thank you. So, um, Laura, uh, somebody asked uh, just a, a point of clarification, please, that, of course, I'm now blocking on my window. Um, so, Laura, when you say carton acept that aseptic cartons are acceptable for recycling, do you mean only aseptic or do you include gable top cartons as well? My understanding is that both are being recycled in programs across the world. So. Um, I think there's more of them in some geographies than others, so one format will be more prevalent than the other, but both of them are being recycled. Our, our mill and Stainland can recover both of them. Okay, great. So, um, Terry, let's go back to the um, investment uh, in, mer uh, excuse me, in mills. So, um, uh, according to the media, a lot of the investment in mill capacity that we're seeing is actually Chinese money, um, and that they're then going to be sending pulp back to China. So is that a good thing for the U.S. mills, or is that like a problem? Um, <clears throat> I'm just looking back at the list that I have here on my slide, um, and actually not a lot of these are are Chinese companies. So I just l leave that point with you that you know a lot a lot of this investment are are U.S. companies for U.S. consumption. Um, but you know that being said, I the the investment that you know some some Chinese companies are making to hedging to you know at the end of the day the Chinese mill system has certain fiber requirements and 
they need to supply their mill system with fiber. And, you know, if they're not going to be importing, you know, mixed paper and OCC from the U.S. as they have been historically, they've got to source that, you know, fiber from elsewhere or, or through other means. And if that means they're, you know, they're doing the actual kind of recycled pulp making process here in the U.S. to satisfy uh, those fiber needs, um, you know, that's, it's it is it really that different um you know so I, I don't know that i could really make the value judgment on you know whether it's good or bad but you know we're kind of retaining the economic activity and uh the manufacturing capacity here and importantly there's there's paper that's being collected for recycling that's actually you know getting remanufactured into a usable product so how how can that be a bad thing um so yeah okay so we just talked Oh, please, Laura, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say real quick, we just talked about supply and demand. So as demand increases, the price then, you know, obviously will will adjust. And so why is that a If we've got the supply and the, the demand, again, you know, why would we limit that? Why would we provide any limitations to where that fiber goes as long as we need to find sources and we need the markets for it? Right. Okay, great. So um, I wonder if either of you can um, anticipate what percentage of paper production in the in the long term will continue to need virgin paper pulp well oh, terry you can you can correct me on this but what didn't who was it that did a study a few years ago that showed that with a hundred percent recycled and no virgin inputs we'd run out of fiber in seven years because remember that a lot of paper production there's a significant amount of paper production that is not recoverable Toilet paper, tissue, um, wallpaper. There's a there's a fair bit of paper production that isn't recoverable for, for one thing, and then the second thing is that you know when you recycle pulp, it, it shortens the fiber. So there's a fair there's a bit of the fiber that gets extracted during the the recycling process as well that gets lost. So um, I forgot the name of the company that the group that consultant that did that. Terry, do you remember? It was like you you have to have virgin inputs. Yeah, well, I mean, we so we did a component of that as part of the research that we did with MIT, um, kind of showing uh, what we what our what we call our dynamic fiber flows model. Um, so, you know, what I, what I would say, kind of in direct response to that question, Lynn, is that you know we don't, as a trade association, we don't make predictions uh, about the future. You know, kind of companies will do what makes sense for them as they're responding to uh, market supply and demand. But I, supply and demand is going to be what drives it. You know, what is the cost uh, profile of um accessing virgin fiber in the producer and what is what is the cost profile of using recovered fiber uh, look for in the future i think what we've seen recently in recent years is the trend has been pretty weighted toward you know expansions in production capacity tend to be recycled uh you know they tend to be mills that are located near um you know markets markets for the product uh they tend to be you know recycle mills um and you know whether whether that trend continues, you know, is going to depend on a lot of things. You know, what's the what's the cost of recycled, you know, fiber? What's the cost of recovered fiber versus what's the cost of virgin fiber um, versus, you know, how much material, how how balanced the system is, like Laura said, because you got to have a certain amount of virgin inputs to sustain, you know, the the recycling system. Um, you know, right now it seems like we're still in this period of, you know, the expansions are in recycle, but I can't say whether that's going to, you know, continue on indefinitely into the future. Okay. Well, the other thing to remember, too, is that there are certain applications that just cannot use recycled fiber anyway. So you have to have virgin fiber inputs for that. Um, medical, you know, packaging, certain types of, pa of other, you know, packaging where you could have any kind of level of contamination um, cannot use recycled fiber as well. Even though the recycled fiber is perfectly good and perfectly useful, just that abundance of caution that the FDA takes to some of the um, to some of their packaging decisions, you know, won't let you use recycled fiber. Okay, great. So we're we're getting short on time. So I wanted to ask some um, questions that I am going to anticipate. We'll have quick answers. Laura, is there some place yes. on the Sunoco websites where um, a public agency that works on procurement and wants to identify which products of yours have recycled content as well as what percentage of post-consumer recycled content those products contain? Oh boy. Well, I can tell you since um, most there's certain there's certain products that we produce, the recycled paper, the tubes and cores, except for some applications, are 100% recycled. Um, we manufacture tubes and cores for the um, the 
tape industry, and sometimes they have to have release papers that, that end up being uh, required to be re virgin for some reason. So um, I don't think there's anything on the site that will tell you that, but um, but again, we've got the, the information on the total purchases. And if somebody's interested in a specific recycled material or a specific thing, they can contact me directly and I'll be glad to help them out. Okay, that's great. Um, so what happens from short fiber that comes out of a mill? What is its fate? It depends on the mill. It can either be landfilled or in some cases they try to dry them and burn it as an energy source. But, um, but we do a lot of so that yeah. it would be used for energy within the mill itself? Yeah, oh, but okay. we've really tried to minimize that as much as possible. So there, the, the industry has been really working to try to, um, to capture more of that material because it's lost value, um, but and try to find you know, other sources, other ways of capturing that and getting it back into a product. But they do, they do eventually get so short that they come out. Okay. And um, Terry, uh, the, guide, uh, the guidance document, guidelines that you're developing, will those be publicly available or just to the industry? How, how will that get out there? Yes, they will be publicly available. Um, and the, the other thing I would kind of clarify is that, you know, this is our first set of guidelines. I, I expect, you know, full well that um, it will not answer every question that everyone has and there will be additional questions that come up. And, uh, you know, I think we are planning for this to be kind of a living, breathing uh, documents. So we're going to get the first version out there for, for circulation, see what feedback we get. And um, there may be opportunities to improvement, other things we need to make statements on. Um, we expect that to be part of the process. Okay, great. Um, Terry, and I think you may have touched on this earlier, but did you say that the recovery rate for OCC from individuals is about half that of commercial? Did, did we capture that correctly? Yeah, that's about right. Okay. And so when you give those sorts of figures, those are domestic. True? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, great. Well, I think that those that we've really covered the um, vast majority of the questions. I've been kind of picking the ones where there's been more than one person, you know, pretty much interested in it because we've had a lot of questions. So um, with that, I want to say um, Thank you so incredibly much to both of you. Uh, great presentations. You will also be pleased to know there's been a lot of kudos coming in while you've been speaking and well-deserved. Um, I want to thank, as always, our sponsors, uh, Casella Resources and Sunoco. And also to remind folks that NERC has many, many webinars coming up. There's one next week, uh, Plastics, a Complex Topic, The Global Perspective. That will be December 8th. Um, in January, we have advanced recycling technologies and products with post-consumer resins. Also January, a bi-recycle training. Also in January, depackaging and commercial composting. Also in January, driving recycling markets. And uh, also in January, it's going to be a busy month, recycling markets in 2021. And then breaking into February, into February strategies for collecting residential food waste. Uh, links for registration for that. All of those are on the NERC homepage. They're all free. Uh, the recording of this webinar, as well as the PowerPoint presentations, will be available on the NERC website tomorrow, and you will receive an email to that effect. And so with that, uh, again, I want to uh, so very much thank our wonderful, wonderful presenters, generous with their time and knowledge, and wish everybody a very happy holiday season. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, Lynn. Yeah. Why are you still hearing? The uh, the reason I had to, to, to shut my webcam off a, a time was uh, the same experience that uh, we discussed earlier. <laughs> a few people got from her nap and I didn't get her outside in time. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, we're still recording, so good to know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Bye. Well, you didn't interrupt the